We're very honored to host uh, Svetlana Yatsenko. Uh, she comes from Pittsburgh, and uh, you can uh, read that she's part of many different uh, departments at her uh, medical school. Uh, she's an academic geneticist, and she's come to a conference in, in South Africa. Uh, we were privileged uh, to host her at the Red Cross Children's on uh, Tuesday. Uh, she helped us with a few uh, complex DSD cases that we uh, presented to her. And uh, I think for people who are registrars in training, intersex is always quite daunting. And uh, I'm sure uh, Svetlana is going to help us uh, a little bit to uh, teach us and train us about the way she thinks. I think intersex disorders are one of the last bits of uh, urology or other bits of medicine as well that is not quite worked out. There's still bits of it that need to be worked out. And we were discussing the interesting anomaly in South Africa of the uh, propensity for many of the intersex disorders to be um, uh, over testicular DSD. And the cause of that remains uncertain. Our own unit has looked at the uh, genetics, the carrier typing with colleagues in the United States without success. We've got a colleague from University of Pretoria, Nicola Lawrence, who's looking at exome sequencing of the gonadal tissue. So we're really hoping that that might reveal uh, some cause for why it is. But whatever the cause is, um, the management of these cases is not always straightforward. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. We're really looking forward to Svetlana's talk. Uh, thank you very much for uh, offering to come and uh, teach us this morning. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you very much for invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and pleasure to talk to you about what we are doing. And I think we are doing very little because we don't know much. And um, this is the part I think we, if we all contribute to the knowledge that might be improving our uh, um, understanding of that very complex condition. So I will try to talk today about genomic causes of 46XX SRY negative DSD. So those that do not have a SRY gene, do not have a male factor development, but do develop the testicular tissue and the, um, the um, male um, external genitalia. Changing the slide. Uh, works. Uh, I might have to go up here. There's usually a. Hmm. I haven't encountered that before. Okay, well, we have a problem if we can't move. Hey, so let's. Um... Okay, we might need to fire up the other computer uh, team. Um, sorry, everybody, we're just struggling to move the. You see, it, it moves then. Share again. You can share screen notes, isn't it? So that's what I'm doing there, that one? Yes, it's the time of the last one. Just go to the presentation and then try to do it. Okay. Always. Let's take a video. So I think now we can move the slides fully. No. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Working. So um, the, the determinants of sex differentiation um, it takes three different parts. First, it's a, a chromosomal sex. So the sex chromosomes define what would be the uh, primarily fate of the gonadal development. And this is defined by the presence or absence of the Y chromosome. Then gonadal sex, when it starts activating the male development, so the presence of not only a survival gene, but the testis determining factors. It's a complex of the factors that really did, uh, the uh, defining 
in the the uh, further development and then based on this combination what phenotypic sex is going to be so it's going to be uh, the not only de uh, defined by the development of external and internal reproductive organs but also testosterone and the um, uh, development of the brain um, uh, affected by testosterone so this is three combinations that makes males males so if we are talking about the um, male karyotype um, this is the uh, normal male karyotype there is a two sex chromosomes x and y and um, on the y chromosome um, there is a sry gene so the sex determining region is located on the very cheap um, uh, short arm of the chromosome y so this is small region is essential for triggering the um, gonadal sex development in males um, this is the female karyotype. You can see there is a no Y chromosome, but instead there is a two X chromosomes. So what makes uh, this particular karyotype being so unique in the molecular level that um, it's uh, individuals with the XX, a female normal karyotype, start developing testicular uh, tissue and exposed to the extra level of hormones that uh, lead to the disorders of sex development. So. Uh, and this is not what I'm going to be talking about, but I want you to be aware that the major causes of the, this type of the conditions, a possibility of the SRY gene, which is uh, again on the top of the Y chromosome, um, there is a might be two breaks on the X chromosome and the Y chromosome, and those pieces got um, repositioned. So your SRY gene is translocated and now attached to the X chromosome, and this is happening during the male gametogenesis. So if father passing to the um, embryo to the gamete or the X chromosome that has a SRY on the top of that, uh, so this. This is going to be a mother uh, contributing another X chromosome. Those are going to be uh, um, individuals who appear to have two X chromosomes, as I showed you, but one of them would contain the piece of the Y material, including the SRY gene. So those are SRY positive cases. In the opposite situation, if the father contributing the Y chromosome to babies that missing the SRY gene, those are appear to be karyotypically as X and Y chromosome, but because the, the SRY gene is missing, those are going to be females developing individuals. So that's important. This is the probably about 10 to 15 percent of the cases of all of the 46XX karyotypically uh, male individuals will have that type of abnormality. So here is an, just an example of fluorescence and cytohybridization. This is the green probe labeling the X chromosome, and the red probe is labeling the SRY gene. It's a hybridized to SRY gene. You can, you can see here is the two X chromosome, and SRY gene is present on the one of the X. So this is the top part of the X chromosome contain the SRY survive gene and you can see it's difficult to differentiate from the normal x chromosomes so that's uh, one of the reasons so um another um reasons to have and i will just show you a few cases and i'll try to show you through these uh, cases um this is the case we uh, looked at the baby boy who had um, a small penis but otherwise normal appearing external genitalia the karyotype was shown to be a XX. And uh, in such cases, we were wondering if there is a SRY is actually translocated. So we use the fish technique to uh, highlight the region of the SRY. And here what we saw that there is a sum of the cells containing two X chromosomes and they do not have the SRY gene, but some of the cells have highlighted area, not on the X chromosome, but somewhere else. So we went back to the karyotype and we looked at those uh, possible additional small regions. And you can see here, for example, this region does not look like a Y chromosome, but is the chromatin material is behaving like a small chromosome, um, defective chromosome. There is also here is 
tiny little dot over here that is also positive for SRY gene. So this is very difficult uh, to realize when you do not have the um, worrisome sensitivity to hybridization. You just really don't know where those are um, segments are located. So in this particular baby, what we found, we had the cells that just contain two X chromosomes. And we had the cells that had two X chromosomes in the single uh, signal for a survey gene, as well as two X chromosome and multiple signal for a survey gene. So what it means that when the Y chromosome rearranged, it's not behaving normally during the mitotic cell division. It can be easily lost. It can be double, tripled, like in this situation. And those cells are uh, distributed in the body uh, unproportionately, so you may have have unequal distribution of those cells um, between the gonads and other somatic tissues. So when you're looking at the blood, you may not find the SRY uh, containing the sequences, but you can find only XX containing the sequences. Um, and in other tissues, including gonads, you may have Y containing material. So that is uh, um, associated or called as the sex chromosomal mosaic. And this is another reason for um, the XX karyotype appeared on the um, uh, on the analysis, but the Y chromosome is, is hidden somewhere, um, either as I showed you what is called the marker chromosome, small chromosomes that are unrecognizable as a chromosomes, or um, translocated or uh, might be attached to any other chromosome. So here is another example of a 16-year-old boy. He uh, was presenting with short stature, severe hypospadia, small penis, uh, small undescended, um, undescended testes, and um, he had very impressive gynecomastia. So um, when we analyzed, again, this is the same approach we've taken when we use the fish technique to analyze, we realized that we are dealing with the two types of the cells. Uh, one type is containing 46XX and another type is 46XY. So those are completely two different cell lineages, both XX and XY. And that phenomenon is referred as a chimerism. So how chimerism is happening? So there is a possibility when mother was developing her um, uh, uh, gametes. So it was uh, two eggs that were fertilized. One egg got fertilized with the X bearing sperm and another one with the Y bearing sperm. And then those two uh, um, embryos that fertilized fused together, creating a one single individual with the mixture of XX and XY. It's again uh, a possibility, rare situations. We don't know how commonly that happens. Um, there is an um, estimate that about 10% of all pregnancies starting as a twins. So there is a possibility of such fusion and chimerism. We do not recognize that when there is a both embryos are XX or both embryos XY because they are having same chromosomal uh, sex chromosomes. But when they are different, we end up with the disorders of sex development. So those all the phenomenon that I described would be as the SRY positive cases. So we have DSD and that would be explained by the proportion of the cells that contain an um, XY in proportion that would not contain the Y chromosome. And that's the uh, differences in the gonadal um, differentiation would be due to the dosage of those genes due to the hormonal load. So um, we know that uh, most commonly uh, the, the, uh, uh, the sex chromosomal detects um, in abnormal genitalia. Those are cases that comes to our attention. Um, in other cases that I, I show, uh, told you, we may not even um, aware of that. So if there is a Y chromosome is somehow structurally rearranged, um, and this is includes different um, abnormalities, deletions, inversions, duplications, um, iso chromosomes, those are unstable and they are commonly got lost. So you end up with a 45X uh, cell and, and that would be causing the DSD in those individuals. 
And um, we um, actually um, approach into such individuals with the uh, testing of multiple different tissues. And I mentioned when we were meeting on Tuesday that we are actually utilizing, for example, urine sample to test for the cells that contain Y chromosome because um, the kidney development and gonadal development um, goes in a parallel. So you're more likely if you have mosaicism, have the kidney as affected by mosaicism as gonadal tissue. And this is non-invasive. It's easy to do. It's you can extract DNA and do some testing or use the cells for the fish testing for sense and situ hybridization. So um, this is just an example of the, for example, you are having the um, a karyotype with the 46XY everywhere in the body, but you can have 45 in the gonads. So those are cases that are labeled as germ uh, cell line mosaicism. And this is, could be a different combination. Just This is just to illustrate that the distribution of these cells are unequal. And if you're just testing the blood sample, you may not find these uh, uh, differences in the cell distribution. Here is the reported in the literature. Uh, um, if you have individuals who has 46XY, you can have a very different sex chromosomal mosaicism. You can have, uh, for example, 47XXY in 18%. You can have the, um, the XYY. So those are sex chromosomes got lost, and those that survive may have give rise to the another cell lineage affecting the um, development of the gonads. So um, to really, we do not like to depend on the analysis, just individual cells, because you not always may capture them and don't may not um, uh, amount of them, not enough to really realize that they are present. We developed um, the uh, PCR-based assay for which we are testing two regions on the X chromosome by PCR testing and two regions on the Y chromosome, amplifying the segments from those two chromosomes. And um, um, this is um, um, the, the bands are that we are amplifying would be of different size. So on the X chromosome, we will have 300 and 200 band, band, uh, base pairs bands. So it will appear like these two bands on the um, uh, gel. And uh, if we are amplifying the individual uh, with the XY, sex chromosomal complement, you will have both. You will have bands from the X chromosome as well as the bands from the Y chromosome. And, and then you can differentiate that this is the uh, individual having a, a survival gene or not. So here is just an example of our studies. Um, I showed you the first individual when we amplified, we got the Y chromosome. So you can see the four bands over there. And for many of other um, individuals we tested uh, with the 46XX were SRY indeed negative. And we proceed with the other testing just to rule out that they do not have the Y chromosome. Um, here is also the, the control positive uh, male and the female control. So um, this is um, another case that I would like to show you. And um, before that, I would like to tell you what exactly we are looking for, what other um, expectation, or what we really know about the survive negative male, um, male, um, female to male sex reversal. So um, I showed you that there is a mosaicism for XX or the Y bearing uh, cell lines exist. This is about 15%. Um, another situation, we have a fetal androgen excess. And this is either virilizing congenital adrenal hyperplasia, aromatase deficiency, um, or some other maternal androgen excess. So those are situations uh, that may not be um, entirely environmental, but also genetically predisposed. Uh, we have uh, mutations in sex determination genes, and those are, I'll show you a few, those are commonly uh, autosomal dominant, and they are the nova, so they do not uh, get inherited from the parents. Um, and this is one of the reasons why it's so difficult to analyze, because you do not have normal and genetics degrees for the parental testing. 
Um, there are other chromosomal rearrangements, um, the duplications on chromosome 17 on the X, um, something that we don't know, but start looking at the epigenetic modifiers and um, the environmental as well factors. So here is just a simple example of the patients with the congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So this was a, a healthy appearing infant um, born with ambiguous genitalia uh, prior to virilization, um, uh, had bilateral gonadal biopsy and revealed ovarian tissue, um, was raised as female. Um, we are commonly doing whole exome sequencing or panel testing uh, for such cases. And whole exome sequencing given just as opportunity to collect the data, which may not be positive immediately, but we can be reanalyzing those cases later on, uh, finding new causes from existing data. So this was the case we did whole exome sequencing. Um, and found the uh, CYP21A2 gene homozygous variant. So um, it is a known variant. It is located um, in exome four of the gene, um, congenital adrenal hyperplasia associated with the salt wasting. This particular mutation is not salt wasting mutation. So this is another caveat to the phenotype that it's not always classical presentation. Um, so, um, just important to know that congenital adrenal hyperplasia is one of the most common probably causes after the uh, sex chromosomal mosaicism. Um, and it's not only the most common causes for the um, DSD, but um, also overall in the human population, one out of thousand um, individuals will be affected with this condition or will be carrier of this condition. And when there is a, a disorders of sex development, 95% of all of the cases would be um, caused by 21 hydroxylase deficiency. And another five to eight percent of the cases would be caused by um, eleven um, beta hydroxylase deficiency. So, if you look in here, is the graph for a different populations. This is African. This is Ashkenazi Jews. Um, this is the um, the um, Eastern um, Asian uh, Latino unknown uh, uh, Finnish um, Europeans and the uh, South um, Asian. You can see the CYP twenty one A two is present in every single population at the high frequency. So it's not ethnically dedicated to the specific population, but sometimes more common, like in the um, uh, Eastern um, uh, Ashkenazi Jewish, it's, it's up to 16, 17% of the individuals carrying this, uh, the pathogenic variants and have higher risk of the uh, babies affected by this condition. So it's important populational data that um, also play a role in this. Not surprisingly, that might be some of the DSDS combination. Uh, the one of the factors milder plus the something else that uh, on the top making that very difficult to diagnose. So just um, the overview, this is the um, uh, 21 hydroxylase and 11 beta hydroxylase are the enzymes uh, that are um, um, transferring the progesterone and um, selotin alpha hydroprogesterone into the cortisone and aldosterone. And when there is a homozygous mutation, you block in this pathway. So you're accumulating testosterone, and that is the source for the virilization. Higher level of the testosterone and the virilizing females will appear um, uh, with the ambiguous genitalia. Uh, very similar um, etiology for um, 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency. It's just on the downstream of the pathway. So here is another case that I would like to show you. Five months old infant raised as a female uh, had virilized um, um, an ambiguous genitalia. Um, she was the product of consanguinity. Um, no family history of genital anomalies, so her father and mother were um, uh, related. Um, and on the exam, um, you can see that this, this child was not uh, uh, having any hypertension, uh, well-appearing um, um, 
child with these small flowers and single pinnacle opening, no palpable gonads. So, um, and on the inguinal exploration, um, there was an ovarian like structure and fallopian tubes. So, um, that was the one of the uh, suspicious for congenital adrenal hyperplasia, but there was not accumulation of the uh, 17 hydroxylase. Um, so, that was the uh, possibility for other um, enzymes in this situation. So, um, we commonly do in the gonadal biopsy, and in this child particularly, they were um, uh, found the rare primitive uh, sex cords, and um, this is the staining with the um, inhibiting alpha stain. So you can see the brownish color over here. And um, this is not always clear because there is a different presentation sometimes of the gonadal, even it's an ovarian-like st structure. It's not always what the significance of those um, um, differentiated ovary with folliculogenesis, and particularly in this case. So uh, her karyotype was showing 46XX. And uh, we are doing the microarray analysis, which can detect the uh, deletions and duplications missing and extra pieces of the chromosomes, but also can detect regions that are identical in sequencing. So those are whenever the consanguinity we suspecting. Um, this is the particularly important because you can see if there is a mutation exists in the uh, related individuals, they may both pass that to a child and the DNA would be identical. So those are um, regions, um, blue highlighted regions, um, um, showing on each chromosome regions that are identical uh, homozygous. We also detect that this is the small deletion. It's a, a really a few KB deletion, and that is um, uh, in the um, CYP11B1 gene or the 11 beta hydroxylase gene. So this is located on chromosome eight, and that's again the region that is here is highlighted as homozygous. So we suspect that, that both parents carry that uh, variant and pass this to a child. So there is a two genes on chromosome eight. Uh, one of them is the codeine for the CYP11B1, uh, and that is the functional gene for, for hydroxylase deficiency. And another is a um, neighboring gene, is a homologous gene. It codes for aldosterone synthetase. So it's a similar in sequence, different in function. And because it's a similar in sequence, um, it's commonly also causing the problem when DNA is replicated, chromosomes are divided um, for uh, missegregation of those chromosomes crossing over and the deleting or duplicating some of the pieces. So because of the identity, this is, happens also to the, uh, the hydroxylase 21 deficiency. The deletions are a very common cause. So because of the crossing over, you can have the pieces, um, for example, here, exons 10, 9, and 8 retained, but exon 7 would be um, missing, and then exon 7 of another gene is continuous. So there is a deletion that would re result in the a chimeric fusion gene, and that fusion gene doesn't have the function as either gene. So it's a really novel function, but the loss of the function mm -hmm. for the uh, uh, 11 beta hydroxylase causing the problem. So, um, and because of the um, sequence homology identity, it's very difficult to study those cases. So those are commonly on the panel or on the enzyme sequencing would, would be missed or may not be interpreted correctly correctly because it one sequence from another. Uh, to do so, we actually designed a few primers. So those are PCR based to say there are located in a unique region. And we tried to amplify the whole um, CYP11B1 gene first before we are sequencing that. So in this particular patient, we had amplification and we were not able to get any band. So we did not have intact gene uh, for the CYP11B1 in this patient, confirming that this is the homozygous happens on the both chromosome and patient is affected with 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency. So this is the one of the uh, gymnastics of the genetics to do the um, uh, correct testing on the correct gene and define the um, accurate um, uh, abnormalities there. 
So uh, this is a little bit complicated, but um, all uh, the network of the genes that are associated with the development of testes and ovaries, so the uh, bipotential gonads um, under the influence, and uh, you can see SRY is one of the triggering factors. And again, this is the um, not much changed since there was like about 10 years this figure got published. Um, we still don't know many more players, but few we realized that they are having different function. So this is important that we more know about the male development rather than female ovarian development. It's much easier to knock out something or uh, make something defective and it's not developing. Rather, the ovarian uh, tissue is, requires specific function and we don't know what genes are actually uh, develop, uh, working on development of ovaries. So the um, idea that it's developing as a default it's incorrect because by default, you will never have the ovaries, you will never have functional gonads. So by default, you may have the not appearing male genitalia, you may have female appearing genitalia, but you will never have the um, ovary um, developing correctly. So it's not a default, we just don't know what factors really play a role in that. And this is also a very interesting phenomenon that beside you are working on development of the uh, male uh, differentiation, you also suppress in the female development because the, the bipotential gonads have the same equal uh, properties. So you have to prioritize one and depress another one. Same thing happens on the ovarian side. If you develop an ovaries, you have to suppress the male um, male development. So this is why there is a lot of factors act on each other as suppressing. So if you are activating one of them, it's suppressing the female development or vice versa. So it's a really um, the dosage and the timing point are important for those interactions. Not only have the factors, but working that whole cast cascade, orchestrated cascade um, accurately. So um, for example, if we are talking about how you can have the uh, female uh, sex chromosome XX, and instead of developing them into ovaries, you suddenly jump in and activate in some of the male factors. So we know the um, R spongin one gene, for example, over here, mutation in that gene may cause the activation. So there is instead of the uh, suppression, this is no suppression anymore, and no suppression will lead to the activation of SOX9, and the, that will trigger incomplete but ambiguous genitalia and DSD in those individuals. So we know that from the uh, defect or failure of depressing, you may also activate the male um, development. So what other factors that may play a role? And I will talk about two of them, um, the nuclear receptor or B1 gene, also known as a DAX1 gene, that is X-linked condition, and WT1 gene, that is autosomal dominant condition that associated with multiple uh, syndromic conditions, including the um, disorders of sex development. So let's start with the DAX1 or nuclear receptor. So it's located on the X chromosome. In, in males, it's a one copy, and the females, there are two copies. There is already dosage difference for, for, this, um, for this gene. So if you're looking at the XY individuals, when you have a deletion, so you do not have anything anymore, you deleting that. This is causing adrenal insufficiency and the hypogonadism. It doesn't cause the disorders of sex development or ambiguous genitalia. When you have a duplication, then you have two copies in the male, they both um, are active. Now you have completely depressing male development and those individuals develop as a female, they do not have the testes and they have female appearing genitalia. So two copies giving you are female development. So it's a pro-ovary factor. 
Um, and then there's a regulatory sequences. So, and you may delete, rearrange nearby of the um, DAX1 gene, which causes the same effect as the duplication, for example. And again, we know about this because we are paying attention to the cases that have the DSD. So what happens with the XX individuals? Um, now you have two X chromosome. And if you have deletion, they, none of them affected. It's unaffected females, which may pass this to their sons and having the adrenal insufficiency. If they have duplications, you may also pass this, and those sons gonna have the sex reversal. So they're gonna have appearing as a females because this is the causing duplication and XY individuals. And regulatory sequences until recently were not really looked carefully, but this is also very important. So um, here is the patient that we studied, um, um, 18 months um, um, old, um, raised as a male, um, ambiguous genitalia with bilateral neuropalpable gonads, um, apparently testis, uh, but um, on the histological examinations, they were found to be over-testicular uh, tissue. So it's a well-virilized phallus, single perineal opening. Um, there's an empty um, hypoplastic uh, labioscrotal folds, um, severe hypospedis. There's no syndromic features, just the isolated DSD. Um, so um, we, when we looked at the karyotype, so we detected this is the 46 XX SRY negative uh, karyotype. And because it was a really a male appearing uh, phenotype, um, we had a, a microarray, um, and the microarray depends what the reference DNA you may run, run. So we ran a male reference DNA. So we compared our patient sex chromosomes to the uh, a male sex chromosomes. And you can see over here, so our patient has entire X chromosome as additional copy consistent with the 46 X and there is no S or Y. So there were all, all the entire X in two copies, except a small region, and this is the region over here, and that region contained the uh, DAX1 gene. So this is XX with the deletion, and I just told you that deletions do not cause the phenotype at all. So how come we now have the XX individual that has the disorders of sexual development? So we looked very carefully at the region and compared to the other females that had the deletion in this region. So this is the, uh, the DAX1, um, um, region and there is a multiple regulatory elements. Those are the insulators, enhancers, promoters that are closely related and clustered together. So this region is as the locus is uh, uh, must to keep the integrity. You cannot disrupt that locus because um, apparently that is the cluster that um, work functionally together. So nearby there is a magic one genes and the function of these genes still unknown except that they they are expressed very early in the gonadal development until four weeks of the gestation. So it's a very early gonadal development. So if we are looking at this is in the red bars, females who had a deletion, you can see this, all of them have a deletion, including the not only the DAX1 gene, but the magic gene. When you delete an entire cluster, you have no problem with the uh, disorders of sex development. So what happened in um, our patient, uh, there is a deletion that disrupt that cluster. So the, the, um, the, this particular were um, insulators and enhancers that activate my, my GIP gene or the suppressing it uh, got dislocated from the, the promoter and the rest of the gene. And that's causing the not uh, correct expression of the gene during these four weeks of the um, development. So instead of being suppressed, it's really uh, expressed un uncontrollably. So, and this is what happens in this situation. So if you have a female who is deleted for both genes, 
um, there is uh, no activation of the magic gene because it is deleted. So there is no activation of the SOX9 because there is no magic gene is working. But if you just delete uh, the, um, the nuclear receptor or DAX1 gene, so you can see it's a suppressing actually the SOX9. So if you delete in that, that, that you are start activating SOX9 pathway over here. And not only just having the by the DAX1, here is the magic gene that is an intermediate player between these two. And um, the integrity of that locus is very important for the disorders of sex development. So it's not only about genes, it's about regulatory elements that beside of the genes. And do we have a power to detect all of these regulatory elements uh, the uh, rearrangement, it's not always the case. So we not always know. So there are some cases will be missed with such rearrangements. So another gene is the WT1 gene um, that is um, also proposed to be um, upstream of the SRY and together with SRY um, uh, activate the uh, male um, testicular development. So it's known for multiple syndromic conditions. It's known for Wilm tumors. It's known for Fraser syndrome. It's known for Dennis Drush syndrome. So those a combination of Wilm's tumor, uh, kidney abnormalities. Um, and all of these abnormalities were found in the patients who had XY chromosomal complement. So, um, those are patients also at the risk of the developing another blastoma. So it was labeled as the not only the testicular development and when it's deleted or when it's uh, mutated, it can cause the problems with the, uh, the testicular DSD, but also elevating the risk for the tumor um, and kidney and uh, in the gonads. So if you look at the mutations, so here is the spectrum mutations along the gene. And with the Wilms tumor, you can have uh, mutations um, positioned all over the gene. You can have a deletions that are covering the, the big part of the gene. You can see there is a blastic zone is never actually involved in that situation. So it's an empty space over there. You can look at the Dennis Drush syndrome, which is associated with the um, DSD, testicular DSD. And there is a clustering of the mutations on um, in zone eight and nine. And those are coding for the zinc finger protein. So it's a really very peculiar structure of the protein that has the arrangement of four zinc fingers and how hold the DNA in a specific position to really activate um, some kind of the um, functionality. And it's still unknown what DNA or what factor it's holding, but activation of that is important for the gonadal development. So here is the um, multiple actually transcripts or multiple proteins can be made uh, from the same gene, some of them uh, controlling the development of the kidney, some of them development of the gonads. Um, the exon 5 can be included or excluded, and there is a four zinc fingers um, uh, uh, domains um, here at the end of the um, uh, protein or end of the gene. So um, interestingly also to mention that uh, mouse model, for example, uh, do not have all of this variability on isoforms or the gene protein content. For example, mouse have the um, what is called this uh, KTS uh, inclusion. There is a three uh, amino acid inclusion, making it a little bit longer protein. And this is the uh, associated with the kidney development in both humans and mice. So mice only have this long isoform. They do not have the short isoform that is associated or responsible for the gonadal development. So if you're making the mouse model, um, knocking out or uh, introducing mutation, you will never have a gonadal phenotype or this gonadal phenotype never will be replicating the human phenotype because the, the proteins do not function the same way. They just do not exist in those animals. So we looked at the few cases that we studied, um, and this is the patients 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 that we had um, with the 46XX SRY negative um, 
uh, karyotype, and we did um, exome sequencing on them, and what we identified that they are mutations clustered, and um, the majority of them were clustering on that exome 10, which was never associated with any mutations before. So uh, particularly, this is the change in the conformation of zinc finger holding or activating some other components that is um, in the absence of the SRY activating male development. So those individuals have the over-testicular or testicular um, tissue, um, this genet genetic tissue, but not ovarian tissue. And those are also at high risk of developing gonadoblastoma like any other uh, XY individuals. Uh, but those are SRY negative um, cases. So now the WT1 not only important for the uh, stimulation of the male development, but it's also playing some kind of interesting role on the um, beta catenin And when you do not have that suppressing function, you're still activating SOX9 and other pathways to uh, stimulate the, the male development in the absence of the SRY gene. So we're learning from existing factors, but having the new functions. So those are a uh, new function on the, the genes that we already know uh, important for gonadal development, but not in the same sex chromosomal uh, content. So other situations can include, uh, and I'll just give you one more example on duplication of 22Q, particularly duplication involving SOX10 gene. Um, there is a other uh, individual cases with the deletions of uh, on chromosome uh, 1P with the deletions on chromosome 15. So those are a candidate genes for the uh, male stimulation, the testicular development, but they are not really approved yet. So this is one of the cases that we had a two-week-old um, infant who had uh, intrauterine growth retardation, dysmorphic features, um, and those dysmorphic features were including hypertelorism, uh, um, the epicontal folds, cleft uh, lip and palate, um, small kidney, um, atrial septal defect. So if you're looking at the karyotype, you can see there is a two X chromosomes. There is a no Y chromosome. It was negative for the um, SRY gene. And if you're looking at the chromosome 22, you can see there is a differences. And this is the area on the short arm of the chromosome. So this is appearing something extra present over here. And by looking at the microarray, what we found that there is a duplication of chromosome 22. So this is the normal chromosome. And by fish, you can see the, uh, the region that is um, on the uh, proximal and the distal arm, green and red. This is the normal chromosome. And this is the chromosome that has this duplication. So there's uh, part of the chromosome 22 is also duplicated on the um, opposite side of the chromosome. So this is the containing SOX10 gene. And in that situation, mice, the knockout models and uh, overexpression models were consistent with the, uh, the um, sex reversal in mice. So those genes are replicate human function and uh, were found. So those are just building an evidence that um, uh, humans also with the gain of that um, gene uh, can have the very similar phenotype. So in this situation, we found very big gain, but how big uh, those gains must be. And you may have, again, some regulatory um, uh, sequences alteration that will cause just overexpression, but do not cause the gain. So those are much more difficult to find, but uh, probably exist. So um, this is the just patient that we um, were talking about. The overexpression suggested the cause of the uh, 46XXDSD and this one, and uh, conformed with the uh, multiple animal models. So what we have in this schematic, so when we start changing this um, diagram, as we have the new uh, pathways, old genes, new pathways regulating this, um, uh, new in 
interplayer modifier genes that are um, in, inserted in that uh, schematic. There is a multiple other genes, um, SOX10, SOX3, uh, SOX8, interestingly, duplications of all of them causing the problem, so overexpression of all of them causing the problem. And I mentioned in the beginning that duplication of the SOX9 on chromosome 17 is also uh, causing the same um, overactivation of the uh, male development. Uh, we also play Singata 4 instead of being just um, affecting the SRY, we now know that uh, GATA4 is also affecting the ovarian development. So it's not really just specific to the testes. Um, what uh, we know about the overall the DSD with the 46XX. So we know that gene expression is uh, maybe altered, ex overexpressed or underexpressed, and this is the about gene dosage might be extra or missing. Uh, we know that there is a regulation. It could be due to mutations. It could be just uh, the sex chromosomal abnormality, gene dosage overall. What we don't know, we don't know how the other factors play a role, and this is what we really have to uncover uh, because there is a multiple other layers. It's not only uh, how much, it's all, also where do you express, um, and are you expressing that in the right tissue, in the right time point, for example? Um, are they interacting with the multiple other proteins? What the connections between those? There are so many players that have to be pulled together, and it's like orchestra that must play perfect to make a perfect sound. And if it's not working this way, this is when you have variety of the condition spectrum of the phenotype and difficulties to find that um, uh, absolute cause. So in a conclusion, I would just to say that um, there is a, a multiple causes and multiple that we still don't know. Uh, what appears to be that maybe same genes may have the different functionality in the uh, individuals with the XX or XY chromosomal co complement. So I think we will be learning about those. Not only dosage, but integrity of the locus is important. So the whole structure, the combination of the multiple genes and regulatory elements in the same chromosomal regions are important. Um, this is a regulatory regions um, disruptions uh, start actually emerging as a new cause. You can see different types of like conversion translocation causing the same um, phenotype. Animal models very difficult to find that would replicate human condition because again we are talking about the locus multiple genes and regulatory elements present together in mice, for example, or um, other um, um, models. It's not the same structure, so they do not play the same way, and it's difficult to study those. So we really have to rely on the what reported and what exists, what uh, observed in the humans, and uh, even seeing case reporting is essential because then it's bring attention to other researchers and help to build the evidence for the um, others to pay attention. So I would like just to say um, uh, thank you for my collaborators. Uh, Soul to Zone uh, came to uh, last for the summer um, a fellowship in three months, and this is what we did with her cases and analyzed and found the WT1 gene mutation. So she is the postdoctoral fellow from Argentina. Uh, Rajiv uh, was, a, was a fellow at the um, University of Pittsburgh, now as a faculty there, urology fellow. We were working uh, with him on multiple of the uh, cases with the congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Uh, Dr. Francis Schnack, my collaborator, he is coming to Africa actually for the humanitarian actions um, through the IVU Met. Um, if you never heard of that, that's uh, the um, uh, organization that sponsors that um, actions, and he commonly brings cases back, uh, stimulates the discussion. Dr. Uh, Selma Wichel, uh, who is an endocrinologist um, in the Children's Hospital of the University of Pittsburgh, and will look together on the uh, hormonal dysfunction, and Dr. Alexander Reykovich, 
uh, from the University of California, who I am working with on uh, different aspects of the gonadal development, not only on the GSD, but also on ovarian uh, development. And that helps us to really learn from the different perspectives, not only testes, but the ovarian development as well. That's all I have for you today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Svetlana. That was a most engaging talk, and I think you've taken our understanding of these conditions uh, further. I'm just seeing if there are any questions online. Um, nobody on the chat or anybody in the room. Um, I've got three quick questions. Um, the first is you spoke about biopsying the ovaries of a congenital adrenal. And I would have thought that doesn't make sense. So you normally get the diagnosis of the raised 17 hydroxyprogesterone. So why would one have gone to the extent of biopsy a gonad? Well, not always you can have or measure things. And again, those cases coming from us from African side, they may not always have metabolic profiles measured. So those are taking us the possibility for um, evaluation. So um, those are just limited uh, here that, that mm. exists. Okay, no, that, that, that makes complete sense. Uh, why don't you kill that, uh, Keith? Uh, traditionally, we've um, managed the over the um, congenital adrenal uh, children with uh, feminizing genitoplasty. And I think we hopefully followed the move away from that potentially mutilating surgery early on to believing that adrenal suppression through administration of steroids causes the clitoral phallus to reduce its size. In your experience, is that enough or do these children still eventually require some surgery? Well, uh, there is a lot of actually discussion about the ethics of doing surgeries on such individuals and there is a tendency moving forward if it is not Clinically indicated, there is no obstruction, if there is no anatomical defect that really causing the health problem. So those are postponed until the individual can decide themselves if they want those surgeries or not. So those are uh, really more and more tendency not to do anything uh, until even the teenage years. So, and many of them later on do not uh, um, select any surgeries and um, they are okay with their bodies. It's just their bodies and their, their appearance is not really a problem. Yeah, I think that's an important message. Uh, we still need to get out more widely. So the last question really is that we've got um, we've got one question from a colleague, but uh, with over testicular uh, DSD, we know that it is seemingly a more common cause in uh, regionally in Southern Africa, and the cause for that is at this point unknown. Our very uh, superficial assessments have only been with karyotypes, family studies. And from your iceberg analogy, we're really only scratching the surface. Where would you advise someone who was doing a PhD, who had some money, where would you advise them to go and look to try and ask, answer this conundrum? So I have, well, first of all, I think none of those or very few of those cases are familial. So if they are familial, this is the pearls that can be studied because those could be genetic predisposition. I think looking at the um, genotypes of those uh, parents who have affected children may help because both parents can carry the, some of the rare pathogenic variants that can be passed on the recessive condition, and we just don't know that. Another possibility there is a um, environmental influence, either in the food or in the tradition, in the uh, during the pregnancy or. Um, um, Post pregnancy that may um, elevate the level of the other genes, and all together with the probably predisposition, genetic predisposition, can reach that level threshold that result in the other testicular disorder. So, so those something that definitely have to be looked at more details. I think we are missing the one of the great aspects uh, of those. Uh, 
Um, and it's not only for disorders of sex development, for any other disorders, the genotype in you know, African population and more ethnically different backgrounds to see what variants are rare and may be limited to a specific ethnic population that you can really distinguish them from the, the rest and say, oh, those are maybe candidates for the study. So it's interesting that you are suggesting that you're really involving as people say, to pretty much create a bank that you can go back to. So if you find something new, you can literally go back to all of the other cases that you have. It's yeah. You get a money that is absolutely genius. Well, so we try to do that because we came to the situation that uh, what else can you do? You cannot have the functional studies. You cannot have the animal model studies. All of these expressions happen in specific tissue, very early in fetal development, so you cannot replicate that. All, only what you can do, you can accumulate and compare similarly affected individuals between each other and find something common between them. Mm -hmm. So and if you do not have that common, so you cannot keep in track of that uh, in the same set, that's the problem. Uh, Dr. Kohli, I think you had a question. Don Robert, yes, thank you, you very much. Morning, you well? Very well. Thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you so much for the fascinating talk. I think we just need to turn uh, the volume up. We're not hearing you. Just give us a moment. Okay. I think we might hear you now. Is it better now? Perfect. We can hear you. Good. Okay, thank you so much for the fascinating talk, uh, Dr. Yatsenko. Thank you so much. Uh, Prof, I think mine is probably just a, a comment uh, really uh, about uh, maybe less of the science, which is absolutely fascinating, as I say. But I mean, we, we are often criticized as medical practitioners, you know, for our traditional, if you like, or dichotomous view of male and female where uh, over the couple of years, there's been a move to say we shouldn't really be looking at at, uh, at these things in, in a dichotomous male and female kind of way. I'm just wondering how much of that is influencing this, this, this fascinating research, because as I say, we, we I think there's no debate that, you know, if a child has got salt wasting congenital adrenal hyperplasia, it must be managed. But that uh, perhaps a 16 year old who who may just have a bit of short stature and, and not really life threatening things that we we are the problem as the medical practitioners as you as it were who then problematize what essentially they would regard or the, uh, the movement would regard as um, a normal variant as it were you know so I, I don't know how much of that really affects the work that you do and whether or not the criticism is fair I think a lot of the times criticism is not fair. Uh, about the things that we do and that we are very modest in you know surgeries and so on but um i, I would like to just get your view on, on how this all affects what we do thanks so i think the finding the diagnosis is important and uh the finding diagnosis is important from one perspective if there is a going to be increased risk for the let's say neoplasia or not only neoplasia that might be with the age is much higher than at the um, initial stages um, it's also important to provide some kind of um, reassurance to the parents who might be feeling the guilty that they have a child and uh, with such condition so this is not only the genetic but it's also um, another benefit to the family learning about the diagnosis and the recurrent risk some of them may have recurrent risk some of them not not at all um uh, from the uh, the surgeries that are um used to, for the correction there is a lot of movements uh not to um, have any interventions um and um just uh, keep uh, again it's up to the patients to decide if they are uh, want to do that and definitely there's a lot of uh, factors uh, society factors maybe acceptance factors it depends uh, but um there is a um, like in our institution, every single uh, patient discussed at the consortium of the um, disorders of sex development consortium, where the not only endocrinologists, uh, urologists, 
uh, geneticists, but also ethicists uh, exist and discuss what is the best interest of this child. And it's not uh, always that the parents would have the authority to decide what they would like to do. So there is, a, in many situations, that is the movement over the um, do not harm more than uh, what I exactly you are changing, correcting. There is a lot of new knowledge about the, um, uh, like reconstructive surgeries would be clitoral, at me would be actually uh, decreasing the uh, you know sensitivity and the uh, affect later stages of the life of this individual. So there is a lot of movements not to to uh, uh, do any um, you know surgical operations on those kids if there is um, no really clinical indications for, for such surgeries. So um, I think it's uh, again um, probably we have to do more on the and uh, really taking in account the the patient's uh, um, information, desire, uh, wishes uh, into considerations. Commonly that was done on the kids who had no choices, no really had the uh, voice in, in that process. I think that's that's important to, to change the practice. It's quite interesting how you took DSD molecular levels and talked about you know, looking at SROR gene being negative or positive, I think what is a red cross we just doing cut up. I don't know if we're doing any more than that. In over tissue DSD patients, one would do a school, plus minus biopsy. And then we also know there's endocrine involved in that and there's psychology involved. And the thing is, as you were saying just now, the surgery is not done earlier. I think it's done a bit late so the child can decide what they want to do. Psychology. So I just want to know, you know, does it, how much does it help knowing this molecular influencers of, of the phenotype it does help you in counseling the patient when they decide sort of what stage they should go for you know in terms of deciding what, what phenotype they would like uh, i think that's what exactly similar to what you was asking how much does the molecular i mean if you've explained very well the implications of counseling the mother going forward but in your institution, does it help? A lot? Does it help in, in deciding and counseling a patient before setting? Yes, it does um, very much uh, helping because uh, when there is a um, dis decision about the overall, not just like hormonal, not just about the sex chromosome, but also you have to understand that if there is a SRY positivity or the testosterone positivity, it's not only affect the genital yet, there is a testosterone affect the brain development as well. So it's not really going to have like, you can assume this is the female or male and start raising. This is the going to be a limitations on, on the level that was exposure and uterus happens. So those are never going Going to be the the similarly uh, uh, affected individuals. So from that standpoint, um, there's a lot of uh, factors play a role, and um, those factors explain to the parents. We were working and creating a lot of educational materials for parents to accept the child the way child is is and not really label this child as just girl or boy. So it's a rare child that in the best interest, sometimes it's a difficult decision. It's a more counseling of the parents than child at that point. So it's a more education to the parents. And I think uh, more acceptance of that with the overall non-binary uh, acceptance of the individuals and discussion about the, this is nothing. It was labeled for many years as something defective, something wrong there's nothing wrong it's just different and everybody is different in many different ways so this is the one way and just accept that way is uh, absolutely uh, perfectly fine yes it's, uh, uh, just with regard to sort of generalize uh, i was going to say respect so obviously i uh, look at uh, appearing it's normal development uh, the ones we obviously know that your um, maternal uh, sort of androgen exposure during pregnancy and your, your small communities of uh, familial consanguinity when it comes to well, the, in your sort of time doing this research, is there anything else you picked up on uh, IVF, for instance, in couples, infertility, and the higher risk in those particular couples, or any sort of general things from the public that uh, was, I mean, 
uh, indolus folic acid or something, which became our standard for premium human for spikes for uh, skin vertebrates. Is there anything that, that you guys have picked up on that you, or what pattern is uh, developing uh, that is uh, in general? Well, any chromosomal abnormalities or defects which are exist, for example, or can predispose to embryo formation with those, let's say parents might have some uh, balanced translocation, so they have a higher risk of unbalanced embryos, those definitely can be selected uh, for the, you know, like normal chromosomal at least components. Um, and, and again, this is the, um, it's, it's, one wishes from the parent, but it's not only the wishes from the parent. There's a lot of ethics involved in what doctors would would be working on or what they would be refusing to work. Because there is a like with the IVF, for example, we had the situations when the um, individuals with achondroplasia or deaf individuals would request the embryos being positive for mutation, not negative. So that's completely opposite. They would like to have a baby that would look like them and not opposite. So if that clinician is uh, okay with this concept, uh, ethically accepting that, they will be um, uh, okay to implant that embryo. But if their quality of the life associated with the different abnormality, this is something that clinician, so it's autonomy of the clinician as well as the parents. So they, they have equal rights in um, having that on the uh, pre-implantation test in particular. We see that phenomenon as well moving forward. It's, it's a discussion about our pay grade. <laughs> other people may be put to have this discussion. I just think it's interesting. It, Kind of working in a field like this because I think although that that we've been fully intent asking about the relevance of the knowing the genetics of the kind of the disorder which is related to analogies, you're also stretching around the world sort of looking at many conditions which will be feeding them, which I think is a is a great question when you when you think about having a situation where that's in future, we would know so much about the thing that you get real the, and, and risk factors are moved to, and then you, you get into the gene editing and the gene therapy um, kind of uh, thing for the girl. So I think the work doesn't only look at genetics or PSD, it's looking at general risk of real illness and real development. And I think that that kind of work is, I mean, it's a fair if you have multiple children born to a couple that are one of the family kidneys, and then you have this burden of. Um, the tumors or, or real replacement there if you can come from that and any and avoid that for us, especially in a couple that come from a community that is very high prevalence and carriers and you know that I think it's I think that we went live to see that, but maybe some of you might <laughs> Well, there is a tendency of what is called the preconception, uh, not testing, but also screening. So they're screening the individuals, have their risk, and then um, either having the prophylactics or the, uh, the selection of the embryos that would yeah. be unaffected because it's a huge burden. And it's uh, um, not only to the just financial burden, it's a quality of the life of those uh, children, right? And there is uh, also... Uh, uh, so society as well. So yeah, there is a, there are a lot of, um, if we have the knowledge, we can prevent it. That's a possibility. Why not? There is no selection toward like the eugenic or any other uh, parameters that people are afraid of. This is the selection for the quality of the life of, of our offspring. So. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Svetlana. It's been a privilege to host you this morning and, and really you've contributed so generously to of your time to come and uh, uh, teach this morning. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, goodbye, everybody, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. <laughs>